Okay, here in the Peyote Gardens of South Texas, you can see we got those uh, Goliad gravels. We got our friend Tasahio. And we're coming back to a peyote plant, well, actually two plants right there and right here, that uh, were covered with buffalo grass uh, a little bit less than a year ago. And so now here we are. It's December of 2024. I removed the buffalo grass in March because I removed the buffalo grass that was shading this plant right here. Uh, it it soon soon after burned. We came back two days later, and this burned. We're here on a little private ranch in South Texas, and this burned. And that blue color is caused by a, a material called farina, which is basically just long chain fatty acid molecules that act as a reflective wax that prevents uh, that intense ultraviolet radiation from uh, the sun from burning the shit out of the peyote plants. And when I uh, when this plant burned, I mean, you, peyote, when cacti burn, especially spineless cacti, it looks like kind of like a bleaching, all right? And I always assumed that farina is only generated from the apical meristem, which is where new growth is occurring, which is right there in the center of this peyote plant. But that's not actually where the farina is generated. The farina is generated by, it's produced by the epidermal tissue. So a peyote plant is just, uh, it's basically just a flattened shoot. Imagine a, a long cylinder that's put into a vise and then squished down into a little disc. That's what a peyote or really any flat little cactus is. It's just a flattened uh, cylinder uh, so that it turns into a little disc. And then again, the new growth is generated in the center at that apical meristem and then moves down the plant. But again, that farina, you can see this thing is fully recovered from the burnt status that it was in once this uh, uh, shading buffalo grass, which is a horrible invasive species down here in South Texas and in the Sonoran Desert, was removed. And so this plant has fully recovered, thus indicating uh, that uh, while it has grown a little bit and new tissue has been created at that apical meristem, compare the lobe patterns, okay, those, those ribs and lobes to uh, what it looked like a year ago. I'll put the picture right up now. What it looked like a year ago, okay, while there has been new growth, the, the farina was actually generated, that wax was generated, was produced by the epidermal tissue. So the lesson here is that peyote plants can recover from sunburn. You're going to get sunburn anytime that farina is not thick enough to, reduce, to resist, to reflect uh, the ultraviolet uh, light to prevent the ultraviolet light from burning the epidermal tissue below and so you would you would get a case like that where uh, you know so you've been growing a cactus in shade and then you move it to sun too quick before the epidermis has time to produce farina and so it burns but they will recover there's another one this one also really badly burnt I got photos of this one when we removed the buffalo grass and it really badly burnt so new farina was generated in, in only a few months I mean there is very little sign of burning uh, on this plant, maybe on that, uh, that this is all one individual plant, maybe on that, that head on the left. But pretty interesting. So you get new wax produced by that epidermal tissue. Okay, you get the epidermis and then you, the epidermis and you get the cortex beneath it, right? Which is, uh, you know, this basically acts as the storage tissue uh, for uh, the water and carbohydrates that this uh, plant produces. Then you've got that stem that goes down probably another, I don't know, at least four inches into that soil right there. Pretty interesting. Nice field study on how peyotes recover from sunburn. Yeah, every time I every time I'm in this habitat, I'm always amazed at the lichens just growing on the ground. Look at that. An ascomycete fungus farming an algae. Oh, it's incredible. I mean it literally if you look at if you were to like look at a microscopic uh, version of, of what's going on here, just a, like a little cross section, you would see mycelium literally entangled around algal cells, farming them. The algae produces photosynthesis, or engages in photosynthesis, produces carbohydrates, the fungus protects it and basically uses, uses the algae, eats the, eats the algae. Look at this, this little, look at this. You can't, you can't recreate this in a pot, all these microorganisms here. You got right all that black stuff is a is a bacteria, a soil bacteria forming a little crust. You got there's a there's one species of lichen. There's another species of lichen. I don't know what the hell that is. If that's a sore or what, I should have I've I've ionated it before. I just uh, forget the genus name. And then look, you got a little bonsai, little bonsai guayacum. These can get upwards of 15 feet tall. There was an old growth one in Brownsville in this uh, hideous. McMansion housing slum 
for the rich, uh, but I think they might have bulldozed it already. Got little tequila canescence seedlings popping up. Ooh, they look like the crust has been scraped away there. They're by animals or people. And that lichen is just, again, just dormant. Need to come back and see it after a good rain. It's very dry here. This time last year, it was uh, pretty wet. Another little yote just sunk in, deflated. That'll puff back up when it gets uh, sufficient rain. It'll it'll reinflate, become very turgid with the with the moisture. Now look, the cobra lineas are so cute when they're young, aren't they? Look at that. You never know it can form a, a colony 16 feet wide by 10 feet high. Really cool little crucifixion thorn related to mustard. Here's these little guys too. These double a double header. Here's another nice little cluster. Look at this. Beautiful farina on you, too. Again, that wax just produced by the epidermis. You learn something new every day. Ooh, who took a chunk out of that? I bet that didn't taste good. Ugh. Again, all these gravels just transported by an ancient Rio Grande millions of years ago. You can see it had been, you know, tumbled and rounded nice. Sourced from mountain ranges all throughout the, the western uh, region. I mean, some of these could have even come from New Mexico. Who knows? And guayacum. What a great plant. Underappreciated plant. Grows in West Texas too. And again, you see in the Sierra Madre, you'll see 12 to 15 foot tall individuals. Look at this. Lots of regeneration here. There's a beautiful little clump. Yeah, something's, something's trying to take bites out of these. And then there's a little guy right there. And another one right here. But notice this soil. It's just, it's very fine grained, silty, sandy clay. It's like a nice sandy loam. Right, it gets very, very sticky when wet, clumps together, and then basically contracts and turns into a brick when it's dry. And so, you know, you'll see people growing some of these uh, South Texas native cacti in these super fast draining mixes in hot environments. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's far too fucking fast draining for that. We have, the hotter the climate, when it's 100 degrees, you know, they can use all the water you give them, right? As long as they get a chance to dry out every couple days. Right, they, they, I mean, you can see this, they're growing in mud. You get a hard rain here, they're going to be sitting, this this soil doesn't dry immediately. They'll be sitting in a very wet substrate for two or three days, all right? But then it's so hot, it ends up contracting into this, you know, this powdery stuff. So if you're growing, if you're living like southern Arizona, south Texas, you're growing some of the south Texas native cacti, you don't want a lot of perlite in your mix when it's hot out. And then conversely, when it, you know, goes to like daytime highs of 60 degrees, 70 degrees, you want to prevent them from getting wet and really, you know, only water it when it's dry. Let the let the soil dry out. If the soil doesn't dry out for four or five days when it's only getting highs of 65 degrees, then you're in trouble. But when it's when it's so hot, like as hot as it gets here during the fucking summer, which is insane, they really can take a lot of water. All right. All the South Texas cacti, whether it's astrophytum, etc. And how much water they can actually suck up, their roots can suck up, is dependent on how hot it is. Lower temperatures, they can't use as much water and when it's you know and with hotter temperatures when their metabolism is actually moving they can use a lot you see there's a got a bunch growing under here and at first i saw that and i thought that was the work of poachers you know some you know fucking shithead comes in here and decides he's gonna sell them on ebay like a moron because he can't grow from seed he's too incompetent and you know dim-witted but then i look closer and i realize you know why don't you just take it easy buddy it was animals it was animals somebody came on here i, I always think somebody came on here trespassed Took them, but that's not the case. You know, it's it's just there's a lot of animal activity here, especially the pigs. Like that looks like a pig hole. That doesn't look like it was dug. God, I would absolutely lose it if it were a queso. Nice Castilla. Wait, this ain't Castilla. I always, you know, these these all the <laughs> so many of the plants here converge on the same theme: spiny, fascicled, sessile leaves. It's either forest the era or Sith, one of the Sitherex slums. Anyway, look at it. Look at that. Uh, look at that lichen. They're two different species right there. Nice. You know, I filmed these habitats so much. I mean, it's granted it's been a while, but still, I always love seeing Corophantha macromeris variety Rignonii. You can see right here, very uh, localized endemic, and then see there's a loaf in the middle, and it's protecting it. See that they're forming these little mutualisms. Look at that guy over there. I mean, not real. I guess so. I mean, Corophantha has spines. The peyote doesn't. So it uh, keeps, yeah, I always, 
so pleasant to see. And there's a kind of serious any acanthus, but the South Texas variety, which looks much different from the West Texas ecotype. Well, it's actually a variety, not just an ecotype, but listen to that. There's an angry, uh, what is that, a cactus wren? I don't know what they're mad about. I get these fucking birds, they're always complaining about something. More gravels, we got Hatrofa dioica, and uh, looks like a relatively large loaf there, and then there's a little tiny one over there. Look at that rich leaf duff, too. All that stuff breaking down, added, adding much needed uh, nitrogen and nutrients to the soils. Oh, wow. Look at that guy over there. Look at that. Helietta, nobody grows this. This is a rare one. Beretta, they call it, Rutaceae. The leaves smell very fragrant when crushed. It makes a beautiful tree with the lovely color as the leaves go drought deciduous. Wish more people were growing Helietta. Heap used to sell it, Mike Heap. His nursery over there in Harlingen. Beautiful old grandpa, look at that guy. How old is that? That's gotta be, I don't know, what? Seven, eight decades at least? Never been cut. If it had been cut, it'd be sprouting other heads. Conversely, here, here's a uh, clump that looks like it indeed has been cut. All the same individual, multiple heads. You know, so for the, for the Native American church, there is a sustainable way to harvest them. Cutting them is not that bad because you're only really removing one-eighth of the plant when you properly cut the head. But then the stem is left to regrow. The, most of the mass of the plant is in the underground stem. It's technically not a root, it's, it's actually an underground stem. There's buds on it that can sprout new shoots. There's another one, look at this. Look, these are very, very healthy. It's not, a, it's not the most robust population I've seen, but this is a well-managed little parcel. Christ, what got this? Look at that. Something just, that looks like insect to me. I don't know. Or may I guess it could have just died from drought. Part of the plant is still alive, but you could see something just straight up hollowed out. That's just the cuticle, I would assume. Look at that. That's the, uh, that papery shit is the, the cuticle of that echinocereus. Jesus.